Um, so I just have a couple announcements before we get to the speaker. Um, the first one is to piggyback on less uh, other locations for Global Game Jam sites in Boston are Northeastern and MIT. Um, and so if you go to the Global Game Jam website, you can find all those sites and pick a site that's close to you and register. Um, in addition, uh, the Games for Change conference that's coming up, I think, uh, in the early spring, um, or end of winter, uh, their registration for speakers, I think, just closed. Um, but they might be extending it. Um, so gamesforchange.com, I think, or gamesforchange.org is the website there. Um, additionally, uh, I just started a job recently at GSM, and we're hiring. So if uh, that's something that you're interested in, we have a bunch of open positions on gsmgames.com, uh, including a bunch of internship positions. So if you're uh, either a, a teacher with students looking for uh, to find them internships, or you're someone who is just get, beginning in the industry and looking for an internship, check out the website uh, and see the openings. Um, and then the final thing is, uh, Susan Gold from Northeastern University is running a study uh, along with a bunch of other universities, uh, and they are having people play the game Assassin's Creed Unity, um, and they have a whole study that goes along with that, and that's on our blog. So if you go to bostonpostmortem.org, you can find out all the details about that. Um, so that's it for announcements. It seems like everyone's all set. So moving on to the, the speaking portion of our evening, uh, we have Alex Engel here, who is a uh, product manager. Product manager of Game of Thrones Descent, and he's going to be talking about the, the mobile launch and a uh, postmortem of that process. So thanks, Alex. Thanks, Dan. So excited to give this talk tonight. Uh, I, I am experiencing some technical difficulties with my Mac, so it is currently on a PC, so I apologize if there's anything wonky that happens so I don't want to proceed. So hopefully, right now, it's not showing me my slides, so that's good. There, let's do this. Dan, I need your help with your machine. Why is it not a slide? Oh, hold on. Anyway, I'll get started while uh, we're doing this. Dan, can you take a look at this? It's not starting my slideshow. <laughs> anyway, uh, so let's talk about Game of Thrones. So Game of Thrones Ascent, Disruptor Beam approached George R. R. Martin um, a while ago, about uh, several years ago, saying, we want to build a game around your Song of Ice and Fire books, um, which is the, uh, oh, is it working now? Cool. Uh, which is now called uh, Game of Thrones. Um, we started talking to George. George said, sounds great. We've always wanted to have, or I've always wanted to have a, uh, the game adaptation felt like you guys were really authentic, so John and Tim, our lead game designer, John's our CEO, went out to visit George in New Mexico, had a great time out there, pitched the game to him, and he said it was really good. Um, liked the concept, liked us working on it, and so um, after we went out and talked to George, uh, HBO heard that there was going to be a game built on Game of Thrones, and they decided that they were going to follow in our footsteps and make a TV show about it. So uh, HBO contacted us and said, would it be OK if they licensed uh, a TV show based off of our game? We said, that was great. Uh, go ahead. And so um, that's how Game of Thrones Ascent came about. It was a great game. A little bit. So uh, no, it didn't really happen that way. What happened was we talked to George. George said, that's great. Uh, love the fact that we want to do a video game. Uh, by the way, I'm also talking to HBO. HBO wants to do a TV show based on Game of Thrones. Why don't you guys talk together? So uh, lawyers got together from our side and their side. We hammered out a deal, licensing deal, where we were allowed to work side by side with HBO. And in fact, we are licensed through HBO. So every con a piece of content in our game is inspired by or from the show Game of Thrones. Uh, it's a really a wonderful partnership. Um, we're able to work with HBO really closely. Uh, we actually have a great working relationship with them. Um, they don't tend to like kill a lot of our babies that, that quickly. Uh, they give us a lot of leeway uh, with our few pet projects, and uh, especially art that I wish had made in the game. Um, so let's talk about Game of Thrones Descent itself. So the game's been out for about 20 months now. Uh, launched on web first, so we launched on Facebook. That was our first platform. Uh, after we launched on Facebook, we brought it to our own website and the Congregate platform. Um, and then we said, we're kind of tapped out on web right now. There aren't that many social portals that we can bring Goda to anymore. So uh, let's talk about mobile. We'd always thought about going to mobile. Um, so we did. Uh, we always intended to be live across web and mobile. So we want to be on iOS, Android, and web. And we also follow a cadence of weekly content updates and weekly builds. So unlike a lot of conventional MMOs or MMORPGs, they have a lot of difficulty pushing out weekly content. 
as a lemon social game, we have a lot of ease in pushing out weekly content. So that's been a cadence that we follow literally since day one. If, if not sooner than a week, we push out content every week, which means that we've had over 75 free updates and builds to our game. Uh, we've been steadily increasing the monetization and excitement around our games. We've had about a 300% increase in average revenue per daily active users to launch, since launch, and we're still going to. One um, of our strongest metrics here is that 54% of our payers that joined us in January or February of 2013 played today. So those are a lot of people that are still playing our game that found it exciting, that found it compelling. We continue to play with us today, and I'll explain why that was such an exciting thing. But let's talk about mobile. So moving to mobile, we always knew we wanted to do it. There were a lot of benefits to doing it. So frankly, there are a lot of mobile device players out there, so over a billion of them. Uh, so one-sixth of the planet has some kind of smartphone or access to the internet <coughs> somewhere around. That's a huge market to take advantage of. We also did that mobile game quality have been increasing steadily. Like I remember in 2009 when I had my first iPhone playing quite a few games on it that were frankly, uh, you know, Game Boy Advance quality, not necessarily AAA quality. And as the years have gone by, mobile game quality has increased exponentially. So now we're seeing Unreal Engine running on mobile phones. We're seeing tablets exceeding, uh, matching or exceeding the processing power of especially like low-end and even mid-range laptops. Um, so we knew that that was something that was coming about. We wanted to have a high-quality mobile game. We wanted to bring that out, and we decided we could finally do that. Um, like I said, mobile device players is directly into audience size. Audience size, enormous. Even in the United States, tens of millions of people. In China, hundreds of millions of people playing mobile games every day. Uh, and we knew that we also wanted to work with a publisher, a publisher that had been working in the mobile space for a while, that knew user acquisition, that knew how to get us featured on Apple, that knew the ins and outs of us building a mobile game. We also had the benefit of a live product where we were actually making money. That's, it turns out that's really important to running a business. Um, so we, we ran a business, we, we were already running a business, we already had money coming in. Uh, that was really exciting to the partners that we were talking to and, and building a mobile game because we said, great. We, can, you know, we actually have a revenue stream coming in. We can continue to work on our mobile game until it's right, as opposed to when we run out of money. And the last thing is the, uh, the mobile experience. Mobile experience is just cool. Like that's, that's where the industry is going. A lot of studios right now are realizing that they failed to catch the mobile train a while back, and they're floundering. They're trying to catch up to these new studios out there that have adapted to this highly disruptive technology um, and are now making billions of dollars while AAA games are, are finding themselves in the lurch. So we all knew that these are the reasons why we knew we wanted to go into mobile. So there were some, you know, some handicaps there. I'd say a complex game is a blessing and a curse. Uh, Goda is extremely complex. Uh, we tend to lose a lot of people in the first week or so because people say, like, oh, this is just too deep for me. There are too many systems going on here. There's too much data and math going on. Uh, in fact, we have some of our players that come and they're like, I just can't math this, I don't understand it. Like, the, this number shows up and I don't know where it comes from, it's a bug, and we'll look at it and say, no, nah, you just, you're not very good at mathing this equation. So, uh, uh, there's no bug, it's just you don't understand where these numbers come from. Which is a bad thing, but also a good thing, because it means people stick with us. And then lastly, we did have some impediments. Um, we first authored our game in HTML5, which we thought was a great idea. We started building this in 2012. And it turns out it was not a great idea for porting to mobile. We thought initially we could just take an HTML5 game and port it over to our mobile devices, and that would be that, right? Wrong. Can't do that. So not very performant. We found that performance just was terrible, frankly, when you would try to run it on a mobile device, uh, especially on low-end phones and especially on the Android devices. It just doesn't work very well. Um, other bad things, Android fragmentation. If you don't know, Android, uh, the Android hardware market is pretty fragmented, both an operating system level as well as hardware. Um, unlike iPhones, which have a very strict skew in what they can sell, if you have like an iPhone 4, 4S, 5, 5C, 6, 6 Plus, Android's like, oh, you have this bizarro phone that happens to have like 1.2 gigabytes of memory, and you know, it has like a jerry-rigged uh, i3 chip jammed into it somewhere, and oh, you have like seven cameras, whatever. You know, that's, that sounds fine. Huh? So the Android hardware can be extremely complex and, and there's a lot of fragmentation there. And the last thing is live game development. So we have to make sure that we didn't interfere with running our live game. We already had a lot of revenue coming in from our live game players. We want to make sure that we didn't um, 
that we didn't just short them and say there's no more development for six months or a year until we get a mobile game out. So we had to balance the needs of porting our game to mobile versus continuing to build up our live game. So I want to show you guys what the web UI looks like for our game right here. So this is my character. Um, so this is, uh, it's level 30, but ignore that because I actually... And can I point something out? All of the sword swords are himself. Yeah, so <laughs> one of the things we did as a company is we had an artist come in. The artist did renditions of many of us in the company. I'm a little vain, so yes, all of my swarm swords are me. I only have like 50 of them, so. Uh, it is kind of amusing when I attack people and I can see myself attacking them like 50 times. Uh, the players, our players recently picked up on this when I posted a screenshot of some new feature we're working on. They were like, Oh my god, it's all him. <laughs> Fame bastard, like, what are you doing? And I was like, I, I, got, I got no excuse. So, um, anyway, so this is the web UI. This is what you see when you log into Congregate, Facebook, our own website. And uh, it's a little cluttered, there's a lot of stuff going on. We have UI elements all around the main screen. This is the holdings, the holding scrolls back and forth. It actually dynamically updates as you build more buildings. Each one of these menu items in the bottom opens up sub menus, and then all of these things do stuff. So all of them are clickable, and they do things in the game. So the question we had was, how do we turn this into a four inch screen that you carry around in your pocket? Um, so like I said, complexity is great because complexity keeps people in your game. Complexity is terrible when you're trying to fit it up to four inches. So here's what we ended up going with. So here's what the iPhone game looks like. You'll notice that a lot of UI elements shrunk. You'll notice that a lot of information was condensed, and there's a lot of stuff hidden from the main UI. Uh, Apple, of course, has uh, user interface guidelines. You can't have a tappable area that is smaller than 44 pixels square. So that was a big question that we had to ask ourselves, is like, how do we make sure all of our tappable, interactable elements are at least 44 pixels uh, square and of course that's just the base. That's like the bottom guidelines. Doesn't mean that all of your elements should be 44 pixels. That's just the minimum you can be. So a good UI takes in a lot of different factors, including form factor, you know, size, callouts, and stuff like that. So this took a while to get here. Um, it took a while to take our complex web UI and turn it into a pretty decent looking phone UI. So this is exactly what you'll see if you download our app right now, which you should be doing. <laughs> I will allow you to check your phones and tablets if you are downloading our game. Other than that, it's not allowed. <laughs> so um, we did make some changes in here, but overall, like, it took a long time for us to arrive at this UI. So how did we get there? Well, we decided we needed to launch an iOS game, so we decided, like, hey, what, what's involved in that? Turns out, a lot. And this being a post-mortem, I wanted to go over some of the stuff that we lined up before our major iPhone and Android launches. I'll talk about in a minute. We did our iPad one separate. Uh, on the orange, user acquisition. So something that a lot of indie developers don't get a chance to participate in because it's prohibitively expensive, and it's one of the reasons why I went with our publisher. So Congregate which is one of the portals that we host our game on, ended up being our mobile game publisher. As part of their deal with us, they helped us out with user acquisition. So Congregate was working on user acquisition, known as UA, during our launch. Uh, they also had what's called a burst spend, which is when you buy a whole bunch of crack players so that you go higher up in the ranks and then attract more organic, which are ten generally tend to be higher value players. So that was our user acquisition side. On the social media side, we partnered with HBO and said, hey, HBO, you know you have a game based on Game of Thrones. You know what your Game of Thrones fans would like. Probably a game based on Game of Thrones. <laughs> so you should promote us. So HBO uh, lined up a very nice promo for us when we did our launch. Uh, social media, we have about a quarter million people that are fans of Game of Thrones Ascent on Facebook. We interact with them daily. In fact, right now we're doing a 12 Gifts of Winter promo right now, which not a lot of players are realizing is a play on 12 Days of Christmas, as they have reminded me daily, because they are very confused. Um, they're like, why are we getting gifts? I don't understand. I'm like, it's Christmas. Like, it's still Christmas in Westeros. What's wrong with you? So, uh, anyway, so we lined up HBO promo on social media. That was a big portion of it. And of course, Alicia over there was lining up a lot of stuff with PR releases and media blitz letting people know that there's a new Game of Thrones game on Apple and Android. 
But the number one thing we got was an Apple feature. And I want to talk about that for a minute because it's going to come back up later on in the talk. Apple decides every week on Thursday afternoon, which is about noon there in the App Store, um, if you are very lucky, very persistent, or you have a lot of money or a big IP, it is easier for you to get featured. But it is an absolute black box. And there is nothing you can do to convince them or persuade them to feature your app other than going out there and saying, you should feature my app. Um, it is worth a lot. And by a lot, I mean a lot. Like more money than most of us in this room could afford to pump out out of our companies. Um, so that was our biggest, most incredible effort, and I'm so glad it paid off. Um, getting ourselves featured by Apple is probably the best thing that happened for our mobile launches. Uh, we managed to be very lucky. We had a strong IP behind us. We had a, a mobile publisher that helped us get in front of Apple. We went out in front of Apple and said, hey, we got a great game. We got a great, um, a great IP. We have a great fan base that's already committed. You should feature us. And uh, in both our iPad launch and iPhone launch, we managed to get that feature. So we did an iPad launch. Um, iPad launched first. So we actually launched iPad three months before we launched iPhone and Android. And we did pretty well. So we got featured except for those two guys right there. So Boom Beach and Star Wars Assault Team, it is very sad. So uh, we would have been number three if they hadn't launched. So I don't know, I guess people like Star Wars for some reason, and uh, Boom Beach. I guess they, they made this little game called like Clash of Clans, so no one really heard of that, so we weren't really sure why they were ahead of us. Um, but it was a pretty nice spot, so we were, we were number two on the, uh, the rotator on the bottom there, or number three, uh, one of those, two or three on the rotator on the bottom, and then we were number five on Best New Games. Uh, this drove several hundred thousand installs in the first week or two that we were up there. Um, so those were the kind of numbers that we saw. We were uh, we were actually on the top rotator here, and if it was a real rotator, you could rotate to the side. We were like number four, I think. Um, iPad was one of those devices that we sort of naturally fell into. Our UI just uh, from the web ported a lot easier into iPad, so we decided to go with iPad first. We wanted to test the water with iOS. We wanted to see what launching a mobile game was like, and ultimately we wanted to see if we could get some kind of you know, success and learnings and experience out of an iPad launch before we hit the relatively much larger iPhone and Android markets. So we did pretty good there. Um, pretty happy with what happened. We learned a lot of things. First, that web to iPad UI was an easier transition. Um, for us as a social game, we did not initially design our UI to scale across small scale devices. Uh, and iPad just offers a lot more screen real estate. And so it was a lot easier for us to take what was a web and social experience and port it into an iPad. So that was one of the reasons why iPad was first. It was just easier UI transition. The second was the iPad launch was intended to provide valuable experience for our iPhone and Android launch. We figured what we learned on iPad, which is a, a high value, high monetizing, high converting market, uh, would allow us to be a little bit more um, uh, bullish, I guess, in what the game was like. So we kind of cut back on a handful of features for a more polished experience, figuring that iPad users would enjoy a, would enjoy more polished experience. Turns out they do. Turns out you have to be even more polished for fun than Android. So uh, we learned a lot, quite a lot of valuable experience. It's a big reason why we didn't launch phone and Android until about four, uh, four months later. iPad players had higher conversion to retention rates. Another thing we've noticed, our iPad players um, with the exception of players that come in on our own corporate website, are the highest monetizing, highest converting, highest retaining players we can find. Um, the ones who are coming on our own website tend to be extremely hardcore fans of Game of Thrones and sometimes fans of us. So they tend to convert and stay a lot longer than anyone else. But right behind them are iPad players. So our iPad players remain a huge source of both revenue and um, lifetime value and retention for all of our players. And lastly, we showed Apple that we were a candidate for iPhone release feature. And we took a look at our iPad performance. They said, did really well. Players really enjoyed it. We got highly rated on our iPad launch. And that definitely factored into our iOS launch, or iPhone launch. So onward to the full release. So iPhone and Android launch. Launch be success. So we were featured in the number four spot on iPhone. Uh, top 20 Google, which was not so great. 
uh, and we had higher retention and conversions. So this was a huge win for us. Uh, hard to overstate how important a number four spot is compared to a number five spot. Uh, one, two, and three are the best because they're the ones that you see as soon as you open up the app. So one, two, and three always get the highest install rates, but number four is still viewable. Your icon is still viewable, it's just cut. So you have like a third or a half of your icon viewable on the initial featuring page. So if you can't get one, two, or three, four is the best, and four has a lot more, um, a lot more insults associated with it than number five. So that was great. Uh, like I said, Google featuring top 20 new apps, we were like number 16, okay. So I, I guess it's all right. I mean, we were a little disappointed with that. We thought that we had a strong enough IP and a strong enough game with enough history behind it that we could get a little higher. But uh, whatever, you know, it's a black box. You do what you gotta do. So iPhone definitely provided some incredible installs that week. Uh, with incredible installs come terrible launch weeks. So we had 400% increase in requests per minute. Our servers <laughs> cried the whole time. Uh, I was actually on vacation. So I was at the beach and I saw the beach for about an hour and a half out of four days. Uh, because John, uh, our CEO, uh, Hank, our COO, Max, our CTO, the entire GoTo team, Kristen in production, Johnny was working on it, Alicia is trying to desperately spin media around the fact, like ignoring the fact that we're having performance issues. Uh, I'm on the forums all, all day, every day, trying to calm people down and help out the best I can. Uh, it was painful, and the root cause of it was definitely uh, database and app server contention and unoptimized code. Code that ran perfectly fine in the user load that we had previously, but you know, you throw 600% more people and 400% more requests per minute at it, it doesn't like that. Um, we already have a pretty beefy database. We have a, uh, a solid state, extremely high performance database, and the fact that that was crying was unexpected. Um, but we moved through it. After a week, we, uh, we figured out that that was, uh, that was great. We were doing, doing okay. We retained a lot of players. Like I said, we were number four. We actually peaked at number four free all apps. And we ended up at number three because this is some bullshit here. That, uh, <laughs> this app showed up for like, uh, I think like eight hours. And they somehow like magically made their way to number three before Apple found them and shut them down. So. When I took the screenshot, I think this was one of the screenshots I sent over to our publisher being like, what the hell, what is Barn Voyage and why are they number three? So that got cut out. Um, we ended up at number three, all three apps for that week, which was pretty incredible. But of course, you know, Kim Kardashian and Holland decided that it was just gonna buy its way to the top, which was really frustrating, but what are you gonna do, it's Kim Kardashian. Um, so again, very exciting for us. Uh, John promised that we would go to Disney World if we hit number one top grossing for 24 hours or longer. We didn't hit that, so uh, yeah, that was disappointing too. So, <laughs> I really want to go to Disney World. It's screenshotted from our conversations too, so he can pretend that he forgot about it, but we have the screenshots. Um, so that was fun. So let's talk about uh, transition to live product then. So we've launched. We have our product live out there. We finished launch week. Uh, the servers are done crying. We beeped them up. Everyone's happy. What does it look like now? Well, now we focus on the long tail, which is where we are right now. We're about five months in uh, post launch for iPhone and Android. iOS and Android players have settled in. We've seen the number of people who uh, have retained settle out. We have the people who are with us for life now. Like I said before, those who joined us on the web launch week and uh, web launch months stuck around 55%. Uh, those who paid, 55% are still with us 18 months later. We don't see any reason why the people who are in this state now from iOS and Android are any different. So we're kind of at a point where we're never, we hope at least we're never gonna lose them. Um, we're gonna do everything we can so we don't. You know, talk to them, engage with them, work with them on a one-by-one -one basis, and just basically be as awesome of a game developer as we can for them. We still have our weekly content pushes. One of the challenges for us when we built iOS and Android devices was how do we do weekly content? How do we push dynamic content, dynamic quests, new items, new everything, even new tech, to a device that's historically difficult to update regularly? Um, those of you who aren't mobile developers may not know that Apple takes a review period of time, which is X number of days. X varies from 24 hours to three weeks depending on the amount of time and the backup that they have. 
So with iOS 8 coming out, it's a great example. Our review times went from like 48 hours to two and a half weeks. And so we wanted to get an important update out there in time for one of our, our web updates and our internal launch dates got delayed because Apple just was inundated with app review requests. So it's kind of hard to push out new content, new game systems for iOS with any kind of certainty that they'll be live when your web product, your Android product is live. Android doesn't care, Android's like, whatever, open, upload binary, press publish, you're done. Um, which is part of the reason why Android's such an uncurated wild west. But uh, iOS, at least, is like, nah, you gotta, you gotta wait till we're done with you. So we have weekly content pushes, we managed to get that sorted out. About monthly app updates is what we've settled into right now. So Android's a little faster recently because we've been working on some performance issues, but iOS, about every month, we'll push an update out there. That's pretty standard, like Clash of Clans and Game of War do updates about every month. So that's that's pretty normal. Um, and then expansion refeaturing with the, um, with the uh, crap, Long Night expansion. I should know this. The Long Night expansion, we managed to get refeatured. It wasn't a huge refeaturing, but we did manage to get some additional traction. So for every one of our expansions going forward, we'll continue pushing to get refeatured. So what did we learn? And what can you learn from us? Nothing is more important than featuring. Nothing. We estimate featuring was worth anywhere from a million to two million dollars of traditional media spent. So in the number four spot, we could have expected to hit the numbers and the download rankings that we were on had we spent it several million dollars in advertising. Uh, you know, we don't have several million dollars to blow on advertising. So the fact that we hit this was worth all the flights out to California, all the discussions with our publishers, all the time we spent building cell decks for Apple, and all the time we spent getting the app ready for publishing. So if there's one thing you can do and take away from this, it is you need to do everything in your power to get featured by Apple. And that means you need to provide them the highest quality product you can, you need to sell how awesome your game is, and you need to ideally have a huge IP behind it, uh, or be worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Now, number three, you probably can't do, but one and two, getting yourself out there and pushing hard to be featured is absolutely something everyone can do. You never know what Apple is going to feature with number one, ever. There have been games that the developer had no idea weren't even pushing for featuring, and they got featured in the number one or number two slot because someone at Apple thought it was awesome. Um, it's always worth pushing on, it's always worth developing your Apple contacts, and it's always worth trying to get featured. We also had a great advantage and a great learning, which is building a relationship with Apple and Google is vital. So we're, we're trying to become a long-term mobile developer and publisher, and you have to build up those relationships with those partners. Um, there's no way around the fact that Apple and Google are enormous in the industry, and being in good graces with them will go a huge distance in trying to get your app out there and get it featured and ultimately be successful for your business. So enough about that. Don't neglect your core audience. We did not neglect our Facebook and web audience and Facebook players remain a core part of our game. Our iOS players are worth more than our Facebook players, but not by that much. So in fact, our Facebook players remain a huge chunk of our uh, weekly and monthly revenue. So they've stuck with us for 18 months, 20 months, 21 months. And so we're going to keep sticking with them, and we continue pushing out awesome updates to our web players um, and our Facebook players. So that's something you shouldn't do, especially if you have a live game. Don't neglect the people that are currently paying you, because we could have easily neglected our Facebook and web developments, spent time solely on iOS and Android, and lost those players. We'd be in a much worse space than we are right now. Our core players then also became evangelists in iOS and Android. The great thing about having a live game you guys can they'll ask those players and say, hey, you love us, or you love the game, or at least you find it fun. We'd love it if you would go onto your iOS device, your Android device, and rate us five stars. Uh, we, are, we have a very personal relationship with our players. Uh, Katie, our community director, Ann and Sarah, and Sean, our representatives, Kristen, myself, John, we all talk on the forums. And we have a very one-on-one -on -one open relationship with them uh, in the best kind of ways. And, uh, and we say, like, look, this is, you know, this is us being human here. Like, this is the best thing for us as developers, is that you see that we're people. And as people, we need your help. Like, you trust us for building a game. You know what's going to be better than anything for building your game? Rating us five stars. And that's a lot better than trying to have deceptive advertising or deceptive rating techniques in your game, which a lot of 
games do. They're like, oh, you've only played the game for five minutes. You should rate it. Sure. That sounds great. Like, that's totally going to be a legitimate rating that everyone's going to follow. And it's totally, you know, doesn't make it so I want to make my game super awesome in the first 30 minutes and then crap for the next 10 hours. Um, so it's really important to build up your core audience because they can become these huge evangelists in iOS and Android like they were for us. We also learned you really got to think about mobile from the beginning. Uh, this is something we fell down on. The go to UI needed a lot of tweaking. We thought we were thinking about UI in the beginning. We built with HTML5, and it turns out uh, we weren't. So we spent a lot of time redoing UI, both on Android and iOS. And uh, we burnt a lot of cycles revisiting our current UI because you know, once you have the tech there, you have to surface it in your game. So our game is very complex, and we spent a lot of time redoing our UI. So starting with Star Trek Timelines, we're really thinking mobile first. Like from the very beginning we build our game, it's how can this run well on both PC, Android, iOS, phone, and tablets. Uh, porting to HTML5, from HTML5 to native was difficult, something that Johnny over there can tell you all about. Um, spent a long time porting HTML5 uh, screens over to native code. That was a long process. Uh, much better to work in a game development suite of tools that allows you to do that sort of organically, so we're working with Unity right now. Uh, that's one of those things that will hopefully be a lot easier working with Unity, especially with uh, Unity 5. Star Trek Timelines actually started with Unity to make builds across all platforms. So from the very beginning, we started our first prototypes. We were using Unity, so we were able to play them on our phone, on our tablet, and we'll continue doing that. We also had the Star Trek UI built to work with small screen devices. So that's you know, our UI artists are working and engineers are working on that from day one. How do we play this on a 4-inch device, on a 5-inch device, on a 9-inch device, and on the web? So that is, I mean, it's truly critical for us that we that we wish we did earlier in the process with Goda when we were first designing Goda. Um, so we're trying not to make that mistake with Star Trek. I'm, I'm very excited that the Star Trek UI is going to look awesome no matter where you play it. So let's talk about some more things we learned. Android was disappointing, so I'll talk about this. Um, <laughs> Android has a huge market share, 84% of the global mobile market. iOS generates 8 to 10 times the revenue that we see from our Android players. This is not typical. So I want, to, I want to point this out. This is not typical for all developers. In fact, many developers find lots of financial success on Android platforms. We don't. So I'm, I'm just going to be honest. Like Android is kind of annoying to work with. It's a difficult... Um, porting and, and support process, but even beyond that, the players we get on Android just do not convert, do not pay nearly as often as iOS. Um, there are about 2.2 times as many iOS players as there are Android players. So say there are 100 Android players in our game, there are 220 iOS players. And those 220 iOS players generate 8 to 10 times more revenue than the Android players. So when Android players were asking us, how come the Android app isn't out yet? How come we haven't built it there? There's your answer. Because we can spend all the time we want on Android, but we never really saw a huge return. Certainly we saw a return, and it was worth our time and effort, but it was kind of disappointing. Um, so we won. Android device fragmentation is also difficult to handle. We ended up building a lot of breadcrumbs and instrumentation in our device to figure out, in our um, app, to figure out what device and OS version people are running. It turns out, Everything, some bizarro device manufacturers I've never heard of, like memory configurations that don't make sense, rooted operating systems and devices running our game on resolutions that aren't supported, and all of those people give us negative ratings. So it's like, oh, my phone is a 600 by 420 and I can't play your game. I don't know why. It's, like, it's got 256 megabytes of RAM. That's fine, right? And we're like, no. How did you even download our app? I'm like, I don't understand. And they're like, oh, I rooted the app store so I can download everything. Oh, and then they're like, it's like one star. Um, so that kills us on our radios. And then same thing with all the different memory usages, like the Android OS, for instance, it doesn't, doesn't garbage collect as well as the iOS one. We have a memory-heavy app because it's beautiful, and there's lots of UI elements. It's rough. Uh, and lastly, but we have high hopes for Star Trek. So, like I said, we're working in Unity. Uh, we have really high hopes for Star Trek because a lot of this comes down to just the fact that we're porting code over from Yoda web to iOS and Android. So we hope that by offering in Unity and by working with mobile development first, 
uh, we'll overcome these hurdles and that Android will become the kind of revenue generating stream that we really hope it is. Um, so that's all I have for our postmortem. Um, I have a bunch of other things I can talk to, but I wanted to give you guys a time to ask questions. And uh, thank you so much for listening. Let's open up the Q&A. Okay. Go for it. You kept saying IP, not intellectual property, or what did you mean by IP? Well, IP stands for intellectual property. It is IP. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, one of the things that we were extremely lucky with is that, and, and that we position ourselves um, uh, from a company side is that we want to work with high value intellectual properties. So that's why like, we're incredibly lucky to start with Game of Thrones first. We're working with Star Trek next. Um, game number three is going to be another high value, high, like you'll all know the IP when you we announce it. And um, so we want to make sure that we have those huge IPs behind us because if you're a new game company and you have a new IP, it's extremely difficult to get noticed in any space. And so, like, I come from Turbine and then CCP Games before there, so I have a long history of working with licensed IPs. I know they're a double-edged sword, because you have to work with licensor, um, licensor approval, and you have to work with expectations of the IP. But for us, at least, it's worked out a hell of a lot better than if we tried to go with our own intellectual property. Uh, less work, established fan base, plus everyone knows Game of Thrones. Everyone knows Star Trek, so it's really easy to walk indoors and say, Surprise, I have a Game of Thrones game. Don't you want a Game of Thrones game? And they're like, hell yeah. Let's do it. I'm sorry if I missed this, but how many people do you know move from Facebook to mobile? Like, That's a good question. Facebook. No. Can you repeat the question, please? Oh, so sorry. So their question was, how many people fled Facebook to go play on mobile? And the answer was, uh, few, if any. Because most people view their iOS or Android device as a complementary way to play when they don't have access to their machine, to their, to their desktop. So a lot of our players, especially our high-end players, will find themselves logging in, like I do, logging into my iPhone when I don't have access to my laptop. Uh, and same thing with their Android devices. So we did not see cannibalization of our existing web players into a mobile device. Instead, we saw a broadening of how they play. Right. <laughs> Preston brings up a great point, which is that unlike a lot of games, our peak game hours are during work hours. So uh, we'll see really interesting things where it's like our, our playtime, our DAU, daily active users, and our revenue will like peak at like 2 p.m. <laughs> People are like, man, I just got back from lunch. I really want to start going to work again. I'm going to log in and like help my alliance out and send some attacks out and things like that. Yeah, nighttime people go to bed. Who knew that? It's crazy. <laughs> Were there any features on desktop that you were surprised with how they were perceived differently on mobile? So the question is, are there any features that were on desktop that never made it to mobile because either they were received poorly or we decided that they weren't worth porting over initially at least? Yeah, absolutely. There were some features that we cut from the initial build. But that was mostly so we could have time to put out a polished product. The goal is to have all those feature, uh, feature parity. So we don't want to cut features from any of our iOS and Android games. So um, we don't feel like that's useful. We see that our iOS and Android players take advantage of all the same features our web players do. Um, so uh, while we may have made some initial <coughs> cuts when we first launched the game, our goal has always been feature parity across platform. Uh, let me go to the side. You were talking about uh, converting from Facebook to iPad. Uh, for your screen resolution. Did you have to do the same thing from the regular iPad to the iPad mini? So the question is, do we have to convert screen resolution from regular iPad to iPad mini? Uh, Johnny? <coughs> yeah, we did not. Scales. Yeah. Okay. So typically, I think it's because the iPad mini and iPads have similar same resolution. resolution. Yeah. Just yeah. smaller pixels. Yeah, just, just a smaller yeah. space. Yeah. yeah. Um, can you talk a bit about uh, the changes that you know, the graphics were changing from desktop to mobile. I'm assuming you have to make it take off less memory to talk about the process of basically reducing the memory footprint you had to run on mobile. I'm looking at Johnny, but uh, do you want, to, you want me to answer? So the question was, what kind of changes do we have to make to our images to make sure that we were uh, within memory constraints for iOS and Android? Uh, that's a big question. Uh, <laughs> the answer is yes, we had to make many changes. <laughs> To save them out. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So we had we had an intern, and that intern's job was to save them out of different resolutions, as Kristen said, and she did an excellent job, and she is now a producer with Game of Thrones. <laughs> so, yes, we do hire our interns sometimes, it's true. Um, so, yeah, to dig a little deeper into that, actually we were looking at uh, Android uh, stability and performance, and one of the big culprits was uh, images that were like PNGs that were still being called entirely into memory, but they weren't like nine slice and they weren't reduced down in size. So it's like loading an 80 megabyte image that takes up like 300 pixels was a big problem. So yeah, absolutely. Memory constraint is a huge deal on iOS and Android devices versus web devices. And your computer will have four or six gigabytes of RAM and a much more powerful processor that can typically handle a lot more than your your mobile device, uh, especially if your Android device only has 128 things of RAM. What you got? All right, so you were talking about converting from, you started an iPad, then you moved back towards uh, the traditional mobile iOS devices, phones. Um, how long was that transition? You didn't really go into detail about that. I mean, the, the way you were just saying, memory uh, amounts are different, processors are different, right. screens are different. So, uh, but what are you talking about in terms of time? So the question is, how long did it take for us to port to mobile? Uh, the answer is about a year. So we started principal development in 2013, and we launched it in 2014. About a year for the full port from, uh, and that would be for, that would be for launch on all platforms. So, so about a year from us saying, let's actually get cracking on this to us launching on the app store. I'm curious really specifically about iPad to iPhone. They're concurrent, Clay. They're concurrent. That's what they are. It was concurrent. So uh, iPad to iPhone, it's not like we built an iPad app and said, sweet, now we need to put it on iPhone. It was like, we're working on them concurrently. We released the iPad one because oh, okay. the UI elements were finished in, in a much more polished state before the iPhone ones. Um, and we really wanted to like, crank down on the iPhone polish and quality. All right. Back to what you got. So, um, do you know why you're performing so much worse on Android devices? You mentioned like a, a, a reason, but it didn't seem like it was the big one. Yeah, so the question was, why are we performing poorly on Android? That is a great question that I'm digging into and have been digging into for the last couple months. Um, as far as I can tell, Android players are less willing to monetize. And as far as I can tell, there's a very strong correlation between device hardware specs and OS version and how much they're willing to spend. So my hunch is that people are playing on low-end devices, which our app we know doesn't support very well. Um, we do have min specs, but it's the, the lower end your device is, the more likely that our app will take you over the memory limit and will crash, which is a pretty crappy experience. So the hunch is that we are seeing poor monetization from Android devices that aren't as high spec. But the, the answer, the actual root cause of that, I can't tell you right now because we're still looking into it. Thank you. What you got, Ken? Why did you choose launch week to go on vacation? <laughs> <laughs> the, the answer was why did I choose launch week to go on vacation? Well, it's worked out well for me in the past. Um, <laughs> The famous story was at Turbine, we had a, a Lord of the Rings online update, update 14, that I was in Puerto Rico for, and I left Saturday, the build went out Monday, I came back into work the next Monday, and they just finished hotfix number five. And um, I came back to 1,800 emails in my inbox, because I promptly said, mark all is red, <laughs> asked if there was anything else I needed to be concerned about. And they said, no, you missed everything. <laughs> so that worked out well. Um, no, it wasn't intended. I mean, when, the fact of the matter is that we wanted to launch with as high quality as possible. So I'd scheduled vacation and thinking that it would be multiple weeks post-launch and then because we wanted to launch as high quality products as we could, we had that ended up being pushed back until I had a choice, forfeit a multi-hundred dollar deposit. Uh, and stay at home in case anything went bad, or bring my laptop with me where I knew there was Wi-Fi and work from my vacation spot, which is what I ended up doing. 
So you said HTML5 is a negative. Uh, would that be the same opinion now with the advent of like a lot of these frameworks coming up, uh, like basic data and impact, and abilities to easily import those frameworks to Android and iOS and stuff like that? Would that be the same decision now? Is Unity just that more powerful and efficient over these frameworks that are? So the question was, given all the frameworks that are around for HTML5, would we be of a different opinion if we started porting now versus when we did it last year? I hate HTML5. <laughs> uh, um, there's so much it doesn't do, and there's so much it exposes, that especially for an online game, it is one of the worst platforms you could pick. Uh, and I'll tell you why. I spoke at DevCon 5 in New York with uh, Elliot Mitchell and... Uh, and um, a bunch of other people about HTML5, and I was like, you could you could pick a worse platform for an online game, but you would have to build it. Like, <laughs> worse. Um, <laughs> I'm just I'm gonna spend 30 seconds. Players can inspect your code. Players can load the entire client. Players can go line by line through your client. Players can make direct JSON calls back to your client, back to your server, unless you specifically exclude those. Players can uh, create Grease Monkey scripts to modify and alter your CSS. And players can ultimately create browser, pl browser plugins and distribute them easily to all the other players in your game that make all your anti-exploit and bug fixing efforts crap. So, uh, yeah, I wouldn't go with HTML5 in the future. But, I mean, honestly, the, the, the development answer is Unity is just a really strong, advanced platform. There's a lot of stuff that's built into it. There's, uh, you know, they acquired and GUI, which allows them to, to bring much better GUIs, which has traditionally been a, uh, a low point for Unity integration. And frankly, it's just, it's not hard to work with compared to HTML5, where everything's on a canvas, it's all CSS elements. Uh, HTML5 animations aren't that great. Uh, Johnny can tell you a lot more about developing for HTML5, but I think our answer, John, what do you think? Johnny, we said port from HTML5 to native today. Um, I probably would not do it. I yeah. probably would go with something else. I mean, even with all those frameworks, we'd have to go back and re redo a lot of our web code to get that support. So the work involved would have been to rewrite the web code and then port to mobile, which is not cost effective. Yep. So I probably would not repeat that mistake. No. Why bother porting when you can just develop in Unity and then output to the client and, and the platform of your choice? It doesn't seem like it makes a lot of sense. Can you optimize in that case, though? I mean, how do you, you know, it's you're compiling for multiple platforms, but you can you actually compile for a, or optimize for a specific platform still? Uh, so the question was, can we optimize for specific platforms off Unity? I am not an engineer, nor am I working with Unity directly, so I can't answer that. Um, but I'd be happy to talk to one of our Unity engineers and, and discuss that with you. Short uh, answer is somewhat. Somewhat. What you got? So you talked about wanting to keep the mobile development going without shortchanging events for the web version. Uh, did you find that there were any like trade-offs that you had to make with the events you were running, or like could you did you change the style of them to keep them going without like you know just tying everything up in that effort? Do you mean is it a resource question like? Did we, did we have to decrease what we were doing for web because we were developing for iOS? Uh, yes, basically. I mean, you either split up people or change the way you're doing right. that well, or I mean, something else. Okay, so the question was, like, what happened? Did the web team suffer while we were developing for mobile? And no, not really, because we ended up hiring people to help do that work, and, and we ended up swapping people around teams. So uh, the start for me, when we first built Game of Thrones Ascent, we're talking, like, a half dozen people plus contractors. <coughs> working on Game of Thrones Ascent. And then by the time I joined, it was like, what, 12, 15? Right around there. Uh, and now we're up to like, you know, we're in the 30s. So we are growing, not growing immensely fast because we want to make sure we do it intelligently and don't blow all of our money. But uh, yeah, I mean, we did grow. So it's like, as, as developers move on to one project, we want to make sure that there are still people developing for the web game and developing live content. So. <coughs> No, it's not, we still did weekly updates, we still did bug fixes, we did major features, we did all this stuff um, concurrent to the iOS and Android development. What we did do is we did get smarter in UI development and say, when we build this UI for web, 
let's make sure we either develop the mobile ones concurrent to it, or make sure the UI can be ported across the platform. Yeah, Kristen, come on up. So the, uh, the weekly updates that we have, we basically have a system in place where we just work with the content team itself, which is also an engineer, so we can basically come in with requests and items and all that without any engineering plan, so none of that's something. Yeah, yeah, all of our content's uh, engineer agnostic, doesn't need engineers unless we want to input new ways of interacting with the content. So our narrative team and our sign team could be doing stuff that was completely independent of the engineers who are busy porting the game to a different platform. I think I see a hand right there. Yeah, you mentioned a game from CCP Games and from Turbine. Um, would you like to compare your experiences working with these companies? Ooh. <laughs> yeah, question go for it. Question was, do I want to compare working for CCP Turbine with Disruptor Beam? Oh, uh, I don't want to do that because each company does a lot of things very well. And um, when I work there, every company I've worked for, I've learned an incredible amount from. So it's easy to poke holes at different game studios and say this company was dumb about this or this company was great about this. But the fact of the matter is, like, no company's perfect. <coughs> Certainly Disruptor Beam, I, I think, is really good at a lot of what we do. And uh, I think we're continuing to get really, we continue to get even better at a lot of stuff that we do. But no, I mean, it's totally different worlds, right? Like social and mobile games versus building high budget, multi tens of millions of dollars MMOs are completely different beasts. So uh, when I was working at CCP, working on EVE Online, we were, I was doing live events there and doing support. And when I was working at Turbine, I was doing, uh, again, support, anti-fraud, security, and operations. And then when I'm working at Disruptor Beam, I'm doing product management and production. So it's not even just the different companies. It's like I'm doing entirely different roles at those companies, too. So it's kind of hard for me to say which what's very different. All I'd say, is, the only thing I'd say is that at Disruptor Beam, we pride ourselves on being a really respectful organization. Uh, respectful of people's expertise, respectful of people's opinions, and uh, that's been extremely useful and extremely nice to see because uh, I've, I've never felt like I'm working with a more talented group of people than that disruptor me. I'm just going to plug the company over there. <laughs> All right, what other questions? Yeah. Uh, how long do you guys give? HTML5 for you at the depot, and like, what kind of, like, how was that decision made? Was it like a pushback from engineers? Was it just like, did you even get to like a demo stage? Uh, or like... Well, sorry, the question was how long did we give HTML5 for what, for porting to mobile? Mm -hmm. Several months. We tried for several months, and we ended up having like pretty heated decisions because some of our engineers, like Johnny, you too, were busy trying to run HTML5 on web devices, on mobile devices, and just, just didn't work. Like, we thought, <laughs> we actually said, damn it, if only we hadn't spent time on HTML5 <laughs> trying to get us to work on mobile devices, we could be several months ahead of our mobile development. But yeah, we, we gave it a good try. We gave it several months of attempting to run HTML5 on a mobile device, and it's just not there yet. Maybe it'll be there in a couple years when devices just get that much more powerful, but um, this wasn't there. Um, you said that you had serious server load issues when you went live. Yep. Uh, what kind of pre-release stress testing did you do, if any, to try and project what your load was going to be like in any service? So the question was, how, what kind of uh, stress testing and load testing did we do for uh, the iOS launch? We actually did quite a bit. Uh, Max, our CTO, and I sat down with uh, Dave, our, our DevOps engineer, and, and the GoTo engineers. We tried to figure out what would we see, and we ended up setting up like thresholds. We did. Like, how many commits can we handle in the database? How many writes can we handle in the database at one time? And uh, we were just too low. That was the problem, is our, our estimates were too low. Um, we'd always heard about games being launched and having hundreds of thousands of people sign up a day. And we were like, wow, that would be awesome. But we never really anticipated it. <laughs> so it was like, and, and frankly, the, the code that broke was not code that was easy to test. It was very complex server-side code that was resolving um, like multiple things at a time and looking at multiple values and altering several different pieces of data on different database tables. And it was it would be difficult to stress test that. 
Um, and we found it difficult to stress test that, especially for a team the size of a few dozen people. So, uh, and you know, not everyone's a CTO or engineer or DevOps engineer. So we did the best we could. Uh, unfortunately, question mark, we just had too many people play our game. So, <laughs> you know, it's not a bad thing. It's just one of those things like, yeah, if only we'd stress tested 600% load, then we would have seen, probably would have seen some of these problems and fixed them. But uh, I maintain that some of the problems we saw with testing teams to, to uncover. Yeah, I, do, I do remember a similar incident at Blizzard either during Burning Crusade or Wrath of the Lich game. I was in contact with some of the dev team at the time, and they had one of those patches where the servers are down for a day and a half after the patch, and they're apologizing to everybody and giving away free game time. And what he basically said is, yeah, it was running great on the PPR the whole time, and then we pushed it live, and 12,000 people logged in, and we kicked over some threshold. I've been in many of those situations in the past, and they are very <coughs> annoying for the people working the game, and very annoying for the players. It worked beautifully until there were like 12,000 people logged in, and that's broke. And that always, that's why you should always test your code in production, always. Uh, don't do that, by the way. Don't. Uh, yeah, back there. Is there anything we're doing differently with Star Trek the new IP aside from being mobile focused and mobile first? I'd say rapid iteration and rapid prototyping is something that we actually have the resources to do now that we didn't do as much in Dota. Um, we certainly did plenty of prototyping and uh, and sketching out and, and iteration in Dota, but like we're taking a lot of time with Star Trek to try to get the right design from the very beginning. And that means a lot of prototypes, it means a lot of play tests, it means like everyone in the company is sitting down in the, uh, in the common area and watching people play and seeing the systems running. And that's where Unity is really nice for that because you just make a build and you start playing as a build. But um, yeah, that's one thing that I think we're doing really differently this time is, is we're actually prototyping and, and running through and providing feedback to the prototype really often. And I think we've nailed down some pretty cool stuff um, that I, I'm hopeful will even more exciting and even more fun than 